The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Practicing What We Preach, Your Role as an Obesity Medicine Specialist, Inspiring Change, and Overcoming Negative Weight Biases to Prioritize the Management of Obesity as a Chronic Disease. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash QFA860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hello, this is Angela Fitch, co-founder and chief medical officer of KnownWell and president of the Obesity Medicine Association. Joining me today is Jamie Almandos, medical director of the Weight Wellness Program and associate professor of internal medicine in the Division of Endocrinology and Metabolism at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. In today's presentation, we'll summarize the highlights from a three-hour pre-conference workshop held at the Obesity Medicine Association's annual meeting. Our objective for today's agenda is to talk about communication strategies to help patients understand obesity as a chronic yet treatable disease, not a personal failure. To compare how current and emerging anti-obesity medications can safely help patients lose weight and prevent regain. Learn how we can engage patients in shared decision making to co-create individualized weight loss plans that are achievable, realistic, and incorporate long-term anti-obesity medication use. So let's get started by discussing how to get patients to buy into obesity management. First, let's level set our obesity epidemic here in the United States. The mean BMI is increasing, and you can see that here from 2011 to 2021. It used to be that most of the states were yellow or even that sort of peach color, which is anywhere from 25 to 35% obesity rates across the country. And now we're dealing with much more of this red here as we see, and our red is anywhere from 35 to 45% obesity in these different states. So you can see the prevalence is really increasing, and that's why we're here to talk, because we have definitively better treatments today than we've ever had before. So helping patients treat this disease effectively is key. Our BMI trajectories here are shown over the course of adulthood. If you look at the graph on your left, you can see here that it is expected at all, of, at all levels of weight that weight increases over time as we age. This is complicated for various reasons and it was also somewhat protective so that as we got older and we would you know, maybe be a little bit heavier, you know, we would not have as many diseases hit us later in life, right? We would be able to um, you know, live through the winter, we'd be able to you know, survive whatever um, came our way, right? But again, you know, we're recognizing that with this increase in weight over time, it's becoming more prevalent to have other chronic diseases, such as hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes. You can see on the graph on the right, the prevalence of those diseases over the course of time, you know, as time has gone on, you know, that these have become much more prevalent diseases, a lot of that is due to the obesity that we have. And this is what we're focused on today, that early intervention on the treatment of obesity hopefully would prevent many of these complications of obesity that we just talked about. So you see here all the complications listed of obesity, coronary artery disease, stroke, diabetes, fatty liver disease, about to become the number one reason for liver transplant in our country. You know, all of these diseases are very significantly um, related to obesity. So if we could treat obesity earlier in the course of people's disease, we could hopefully prevent a lot of these diseases from occurring and a lot of the complications as such. About how much weight loss is needed to reduce cardiovascular risks in people with obesity? What do you think, Dr. Almandos? You know, I think it depends on what we mean by decreasing cardiovascular risk. I think studies have shown that anywhere from even starting at 3% up to 10% can really improve the numbers in terms of blood pressure, glycemia. But if we're looking at heart outcomes, decreasing cardiovascular events or trying to induce remission in things like diabetes, I think we're really talking north of about 15% weight reduction. Exactly. And that's what's illustrated here is that, you know, we get some of these early effects of of these chronic diseases, such as making our blood pressure better, reducing our triglycerides, some early benefits on glycemia in this early 5 to 10% weight loss category. 
but we have to get upwards of 10 to 15% weight loss if we're really going to reduce cardiovascular events, major cardiovascular risk events and mortality, especially what we've seen at least in people with type 2 diabetes and the remission of type 2 diabetes especially. Now let's talk about some motivational interview techniques called the five A's. First, we really want to ask for permission to discuss body weight. Many patients have been stigmatized for much of their life. And so again, approaching this in a patient-centered way, in a non-stigmatized way is important. For, for example, you could say, I'm concerned about how your weight may be affecting your health. Is this something we could talk about today? Versus saying something like, your weight's a problem, let's fix it. So asking for permission is very important. And then assessing, assessing the patient's risk factors, assessing their BMI as a screening tool for where they're at with the disease of obesity, their waist circumference as it relates to metabolic syndrome, and their obesity stage as it relates to some of the complications that they may be dealing with. And then advise the patient about the health risks of obesity, the benefits of modest weight loss in that 5 to 10% range, as you said, and the need for a long-term strategy and treatment options. Agree on realistic weight loss expectations, targets, and behavioral changes, and specific details of the treatment plan. It may be unrealistic, for example, if a patient says they're going to you know, run on the treadmill for 60 minutes every day. Make sure to level set that and to agree on something that can be realistic and attainable. And then arrange and assist for follow-up. Right? One of the biggest issues it's, is that we see is that people just don't often follow up because they don't think it's important for them to follow up. Make sure they understand it's very important to you that they follow up so you can see how they're doing, even if what's happened has not been as successful as they had hoped. You know, reducing that stigma around that outcome is important. Actions and words matter. Communication strategies that reduce stigma and improve well-being are important. Be positive and focus on the benefits. Be collaborative and helpful and provide information on various resources. And be aware of nonverbal communication as well. Be understanding that up to 80% of obesity might be genetically determined. And be environmentally aware and have appropriate equipment in your facilities. Patients are very embarrassed when, for example, the gown doesn't fit or the uh, chair is too small. So make sure that your office is adaptable to people with obesity. We're now going to hear from a patient by the name of Mike Barnes. He's a 52-year-old man who has a BMI of 36. He has an A1C of 5.8 and his blood pressure is mildly elevated. He has a twin brother who recently died from a heart attack and his wife is worried about his health and wanted him to be seen. He owns a car dealership and has to frequently socialize for business entertainment. Unfortunately, he has knee pain that limits his exercise today and in the past, he was a collegiate wrestler, so he relied on exercise heavily in order to maintain his weight, as well as some other potentially uh, negative ways of, of losing weight as it relates to some of the things that were done in college in his collegiate wrestling career. You can see here that his HDL is a little bit low, and he has prediabetes, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, and sleep apnea. He's already on rosuvastatin, an antihypertensive medication, and some naproxen for his knee pain. Let's now look at Mike's telehealth visit. Hello, I'm Dr. Monica West. Hey doc, how are you? Good, you're Mr. Barnes. Do you prefer to be called Mr. Barnes or Mike? Oh no, you can call me Mike. Okay. Everybody calls me Mike. Good, well hello Mike. Um, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself and what brings you in today? So, all right, so let's see. So I'm uh, 55 years old. I am a husband, a father of three adult children. Uh, one's still at the university. The other two are up and grown and gone. Um, I own the local car dealership. Um, you may have purchased your car there. I don't know. Um, if not, you should come on down. We're having a sale. So you, if you need a new car, you know anybody that needs a new car, send them on down and uh, let them know to let me know that you sent them and, and we'll see what we can do for them. So, um, so we'll be able to do that. Um, so what brings me in today? So my wife, Linda, um, set up this telemedicine appointment because she's concerned um, about a, a bunch of things. But um, most recently, my, uh, my twin brother, Mark, uh, passed away uh, two months ago from a heart attack. Um, and that sort of freaked Linda out. I mean, it freaked us all out, obviously. Um, it was very sad, but um, 
but Linda sort of got all um, worked up about it um, in a in a way uh, that she's concerned about my health, um, and I keep telling her that I'm not my brother Mark. Um, he was very much um, out of shape. Um, I was always an athlete in high school and college, and so I'm certainly in much better shape than Mark ever was. Um, but I told her I would do this appointment just to make sure that she felt okay about it. So, so that's why I'm here today. Okay. Well, I'm sorry for your loss, um, first of all. Um, but your wife is right to be concerned. Um, according to the pre-visit labs that I asked you to get um, prior to today's visit, uh, they included blood glucose. And according to that, you are in the pre-diabetic range. Oh, well, yeah, but that's, I mean, that's not, pre-diabetes is not really a thing, right? It's, I mean, they sort of made that up, right? Well, it is a thing. It isn't made up, um, but you've also got uh, cholesterol, your blood pressure's on the high side. Um, these are risk factors for heart disease. Well, and yeah, but your again, sorry, guys, guys 55, like, in, I mean, you know, running a car dealership, there's always that sort of stress level. Um, but I also know that, that lots of those scales, right, the scales get changed, right? So one, one week, nobody's hypertensive. And then the following week, there's a whole bunch more people that are hypertensive because they've changed the numbers or um, so it's just and, and again, that's it, it's. I've always been healthy. Um, again, you know, I've always been, um, you know, in in good shape. So, well, the scales change because as time goes by, we learn more. Um, and given, you know, your brother's situation, um, it's it's not unreasonable for there to be concern about your your current state of health. Um, ideally, we'd like to get your weight down by about thirty to forty percent and see you at a BMI of about twenty two. Or so. Oh. Yeah, and well, and and so I know about BMI from again from high school and college. You know, being an athlete, the BMI charts don't really they apply differently, obviously, to um, athletes and former athletes because of the sort of whole muscle to fat ratio and the muscular structure um, in athletes and former athletes is obviously different. So BMIs, it's it's one of those numbers that means sort of less relevant for. Um, for athletes and former athletes. I see. Um, let me ask you, Mike, if you had to lose weight, what is your preferred method for lo losing weight? Um, so, well, so I, I would do what I've typically done um, in the past. I do some um, pretty intensive workouts. Um, I'll, so I'll do that. I'll certainly, um, you know, change, obviously, um, some uh, food intake and, and sort of amounts. Um, and then I'll do a weight sweat, um, but we'll do workouts on a, on a different schedule um, with that, so. So weight sweat, so you, you said different intakes of food, so does that mean starvation or fasting or? Yeah, so I mean, you'll, I mean, you, you change, you might eat just, um, you know, just, um, uh, you know, just chicken breasts and, and, and you'll do a weight sweat while you're doing that just to, to drop weight, but keep protein. Um, or you might bulk up depending on what weight you needed to make. So, um, so I, I've done both in terms of, um, putting all the weight on, taking the weight off. Um, and I, I'm, I can always make, I can always make weight. Obviously it's a little, little harder now than it used to be, right? The older I get and, uh, and uh, my knee acts up a little, so it, I, I can't work out quite as intensely as I used to. Um, but overall, um, and so you would ask about weight sweats. So, so in, I, I don't know how familiar you are with, with wrestling. Um, but what we used to do is we'd do a weight sweat. So under our sweatshirts and sweatpants, we would wear, um, either garbage bags taped up or, um, an actual plastic, more plasticky kind of suit. Um, so you would actually sweat more. So you actually sweat more weight. Um, out. Um, so we call it, we always called it a weight sweat. So that's what coach would call it. Um, so we could okay. make, so we could make weight. We could drop those extra, you know, four to five pounds um, right, right before we went on scale. Okay. I got to tell you, those are very dangerous methods for short-term weight loss. Oh no, they work really well. They super, well, they, super they may be effective, but they're still dangerous nonetheless. Um, 
I would prefer that you do things um, that would be maybe not as quick, but steady. Um, walking, swimming if your knee is bothering you, stationary bikes, uh, things like that that are, you know, definitely safer for you um, and also would have slower but long-term weight loss. Okay. What do you think about that? I mean, I, those are all good exercises. I don't know that they, they help you drop a lot of weight um, in the same ways that the others do. Okay, what about focusing on what you eat? Um, I noticed that your food diary is full of fried food, fatty food, cheeses. Um, yeah, but, I mean, most of that's most of that's from weekends, and so I do um, with the with the dealership. And and again, I'm I'm still here in my hometown, so I'm connected to a lot of people um, that I used to wrestle with, and um, and I currently coach um, football and basketball at the high school. Um, as well. So I have lots of the team and their families over. So we'll do tailgates every week. Um, yeah, we call it the barn burner. Um, the barns burner um, is what it got named as. So, um, so yeah, so I mean, we have typical tailgate foods there. So, you know, we got ribs, we got burgers, we got uh, sausage. Um, we have a whole bunch of those kinds of things. Um, you know, we recently added some vegetables because my, um, my wife's nephew is, uh, is vegan. Um, so we have uh, some cauliflower, so we do some, we call them cauliflower wings. So we um, bread them and deep fry them, and then we um, put them in some buffalo sauce. So they taste just like chicken wings, but they're not. So, so that's certainly, um, you know, we added more vegetables that way. Um, we always have the veggie tray out, although, you know, the, the, with the tomatoes and the, and the celery, and that usually gets, um, there's usually a lot of that left over at the end. But, um, but we still put it out every tailgate. Um, and yeah, so, I mean, a lot of that's on the weekends that you see on the food diary. I, I, you know, I, I eat, you know, other things during the week. Um, but I'm mostly a meat and potatoes guy. So. I see. Um, I got to tell you, eating like that occasionally is not the healthiest eating like that every weekend. There's no way you're going to lose weight eating like that. Um, you almost had me with the, the cauliflower and then you told me that you deep fried it. So you should, you should come and you should come and try it, doc. You're all, you have a standing, and I, and I you have a standing what? invitation. Well, thank you. It sounds like a lot of fun. Um, how would you feel about if you're not willing to change your diet? And it sounds like you're not because it sounds like the, the social aspect of it yeah. is yeah. very important. Um, there are some weight loss medications, um, maybe surgery. What, what do you think about those as options for weight loss? Surgery, you mean knee surgery or? We could talk about surgery. knee surgery if your knee is, is really giving oh, you I don't trouble. Think, yeah, I don't think my knee is that, no, I don't think my knee is that bad. It acts up from time to time. Like if, I, if I've been on my feet at the dealership, for a long time, but I, I'm not sure that, um, like all the guys I know that have knee surgery, it's there, it's just, it's a long recovery and I, I don't think it's that bad. So. And what about weight loss medications? Would you consider those? Well, I mean, those are always things that I, you know, I always stayed away from those. Um, those were things that coach always swore us off of, um, you know, again, in the seventies and eighties, um, those medications are, they're, they're, uh, they're just not good. So, so I, it seems odd to me, doc, that that's one of the things that you're suggesting. Cause I mean, that to me has always been, you know, always felt totally unhealthy and, um, and we sort of try and stay away from drugs where, you know, wherever we can. Well, the weight loss medications of today are very different from medications that you may be thinking of from your high school and college days. And the weight loss medications today really help lower weight and reduce the risk of all the other diseases and, and health issues related with overweight, um, the cardiovascular problems, the diabetic problems. Um, but if you're not willing to consider those, I, I, I'm really, I don't know what else I can offer you at this point. Um, well, I think, I'd be well, happy. I, yeah, sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. Sorry. No, I was going to say, I'd be happy to discuss um, strategies, diet, exercise, weight loss, medications, if there comes a time when you'd be willing to consider that. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I think at this point, I just, I, again, I'm going to get, I, I told Linda I would get back to working out, so I'm definitely going to do that. And I just need to figure out, you know, and, and sort of focus on it. 
the, the days at the dealership um, have been long, but that's starting to ease up, so I'll have some more time to work out. So I, I think I can sort of pull it all back together, so. Okay, well, I'll be here when you're ready to um, start some kind of program and just, you know, give me a call and, and we'll see what we can do. All right, all right, Doc. Um, I'll be sure to tell Linda that we, uh, that we had a good conversation and, uh, and I hope to see you at the dealership. Tell all your friends. Uh, you just may. Best of luck to you, Hopefully Mike. we'll see you soon. Thanks. Okay, take care. All right. So, Dr. Alamandos, how effective were Dr. West's approach and motivational interviewing techniques with Mike, do you think? You know, I think there were some well, well-intentioned attempts to get information and to engage Mike, but I, I think we can all agree that maybe these weren't the best as executed motivational interviewing techniques in Dr. West trying to connect with Mike about kind of his perception of what his weight is doing to his health or ways in which um, they can work on a plan together. Exactly. I think it's so challenging sometimes too, you know, to connect. And I think the whole time he was just trying to sell her a car, you know, and it's hard, hard to fight back against sometime, right? You know, to get, take that back. And then at what stage of change would you consider Mike to be in? I think he's definitely in a pre-contemplation or even prior to a pre-contemplation type stage right now. Like you said, he's seen more focus on selling a car and just kind of pleasing his wife to say, hey, you know what, I met with Dr. West the way you wanted me to, let's close this chapter. So I'm not quite sure he's in a position to make any meaningful changes for himself right now. And it is very hard, right, to change people, you know, to take people through these stages of change and they all come at it at different times. So that's what we're here to talk about is how to help people, you know, accomplish that. And here are these stages of change that we just talked about, right? There's the pre-contemplation, the unawareness of the problem. Perhaps over the course of the video visit, you know, he became more contemplative, I think, because he sort of recognized that maybe some of these things, you know, might be something he might work on. So at least, you know, maybe we moved him a little bit such that, you know, Dr. West could have said, oh, he let's follow up instead of sort of leaving it in his court, say, let's really follow up in the next month so we can talk about how these things are going, you know, to sort of nail that down. And then we have contemplation, preparation, action, maintenance, and relapse. Because we know that these stages of change continually go back and forth over time. And it's our job as clinicians to try to really sort of figure out where people are so we can help people, you know, get to that next stage. Is BMI an accurate measurement of obesity, do you think? You know, I think this is such an important question given the diversity of patients we see from both an age, sex, and race ethnicity perspective. I think BMI can be a good screening tool uh, for obesity and risk for cardiometabolic complications, but we need to acknowledge that this is kind of a ratio of height to weight, and that weight can be made up of so many things. For, for some people who are more athletic, it's likely to be more lean mass, which is going to confer benefits for cardiometabolic health relative to if somebody's more sedentary, perhaps older or postmenopausal, there may be more adiposity. So I think it's important for us to acknowledge that there definitely is a role for BMI in helping us with our patients in terms of determining their risk, but we can't look at BMI as an, as an absolutely perfect tool for risk stratification. Exactly. You can see here just from looking at the classes of obesity as it relates to BMI, right? These, these come from the fact that we have data to show that as BMI increases, the mortality of that patient can tend to increase. But that's not, you know, that's an aggregate um, amount of patients. That's not an individual personalized sort of identification of adiposity, right? We're really trying to get at, you know, what is people's excess adiposity? Because obesity is a disease of excess adiposity. And that's what, or body fat, if you will. So that's what we're really trying to accomplish when we're looking at that as clinicians, and not only as to how much adiposity they have, but where is it located, right? Is it in that visceral compartment? Is it in that waist circumference, which then leads to more issues with metabolic disease? In fact, we know among Asians, for example, a BMI even greater than 23 may be more appropriate cutoff point to define overweight and to screen for type 2 diabetes. And then as you mentioned, postmenopausal women, in particular BMI, may underestimate how much body fat they have because of the, some of the issues with menopause that we'll talk about a little bit later. And then among retired athletes like Mike, you know, and in general in NFL football players, the BMI was shown to overestimate body fat 
um, in particular. So again, you know, recognizing these differences is important and sort of agreeing with him that there are some of these differences, but then there are also, you know, other issues we can look at like waist circumference to also risk stratify. So if we really have to ditch, when we talk about obesity in general, we have to ditch these old assumptions about energy balance for new approaches to obesity treatment. Our old assumptions was that there was purposeful behavior that was driving the physiology, meaning it was sort of all our fault, meaning if I just exercised more and I, if I could just eat less, you know, I would actually you know, cure this disease that I have. And really what we're learning now is there's a, this new approach, which is, is the physiologic regulation of energy balance is really what's also driving behavior. So it's not that these things, these behaviors that we might do in our world are, are all from just our own, our own willpower, right? This is really about our chemistry, not about some character choice we're making. And it's these chemical changes in our body that drive us to eat and drive our appetite up, especially when we try to lose weight. So that regulation of abnormal physiology is really what we're trying to get at um, as we're gonna discuss here in a minute. A homeostatic weight regular, regulatory system that we have in the human body prevents deviation from a body weight set point on purpose so that we could survive all the famines and winters and all the other stuff we had in the past. Now, unfortunately, uh, in, in our day to day, we have a lot of hyperpalatable foods. We have a lot of other issues such as lack of sleep, um, stress, and other factors in our environment that are really leading to an increase in weight gain. So this deviation from the set point is really um, a, a challenge for us because if we're trying to lose weight, our body fights back with these homeostatic controls that make our weight go back up. Here we have an overview of recommended obesity treatments. We call this our pillars of obesity care. We have nutritional intervention, physical activity, and behavioral therapy, and then we layer on top of that pharmacotherapy and bariatric procedures. The idea is these are not mutually exclusive and that patients move throughout them through the course of time. We have several FDA-approved medications for long-term use in the treatment of obesity, and with new research coming, we will hopefully have other agents soon. When we look at you know, when and why are anti-obesity medications a good option, you know, we really look at sort of you know, how many complications do people have from their disease. If they have obesity, but no obesity-related complications, meaning their BMI is greater than 30, then we may start with a lifestyle intervention first, and if that's not effective, then add an anti-obesity medication. If they have one mild to moderate obesity-related comorbidity, then again, if their BMI is even greater than 27, you know, we really consider it almost first line to treat that patient more aggressively with an anti-obesity medication while they're working on some of these other lifestyle interventions. And then as those obesity-related complications get more severe, such as diabetes, or maybe the patient needs a kidney transplant and needs to lose weight in order to get that kidney transplant, you know, we're really gonna add those obesity medications first line to really treat that obesity and hopefully get rid of these complications uh, in the long run. Here is a slide just overviewing all of our anti-obesity pharmacotherapy that's available today in all of the different, different forms and where it works. You know, you can see that we have medications that work not only on the um, gastrointestinal system, but also work in our brain. So again, when we have medications that work in multiple locations, it helps them to be more effective, which is why some of our newer therapies, uh, such as GLP-1 agonists, uh, listed here as liraglutide and semaglutide, because they work not only in the brain, but also work in the gut, they're working in two different places. So that's really affording more uh, weight loss results or more obesity treatment efficacy. Here's what we look at, here's what I was trying to say by that, in that we have our older medications for obesity, and this uh, graph just shows you the mean weight change from baseline, right, versus a placebo, placebo in the orange and intervention in the blue. And you can see our older medications, such as fentamine topiramate, bupropion naltrexone, liraglutide, we're around about in the you know, six to eight percent weight loss range. As we get into our newer medications now, such as semaglutide, which is approved for long-term use, now we're at 15% on average of a weight loss. So we've almost, we've doubled the amount of weight loss power we can get with our treatments. Coming soon, hopefully, uh, for um, anti-obesity uh, pharmacotherapy on the market now for diabetes treatment is trisepatide. 
And you can see here from the data in people with just obesity, you can see that now we're able to get upwards of 20% weight loss uh, for a, on average even, uh, with our newer pharmacotherapy. This is what's very exciting and why we're here today. So AOMs not only improve or treat obesity, but they reduce these cardiovascular risk factors that we talked about earlier. And you can see where uh, there are down arrows and up arrows. And you can see that um, while some of our medications do increase heart rate a little bit, that's the HR listed there, you know, it's very minimal typically of a heart rate increase. So we're not seeing like big jumps like we used to see um, with um, fentramine, for example, but more milder increases in heart rate. Most of the time, all of these effects are good things, right? Decreases in triglycerides, significant decrease in control of blood sugar. And then again, you know, we're starting to see some outcome data with diseases like fatty liver disease, where there's an improvement in that in and of itself, which is very exciting, you know, meaning we don't want to have fatty liver disease progress to cirrhosis and need transplant. So again, we're looking at some um, exciting outcomes over time. Here you can see the rationale for pairing anti-obesity medications with lifestyle interventions. Most of the time people come in, again, thinking, I can just do this myself. I can just do this with my lifestyle alone, you know, making these changes. These waterfall plots are each, each row is an individual patient. And you can see in lifestyle modification alone, where there are a significant portion of people on the left-hand side of the graph in red there that have actually gained weight during the um, intervention. And then you see the people on the right and the far right, some people have even lost 30% of their weight, but it's not the vast majority of them. It's a very skinny line that we have there, you know, that's running down that, that right side of that uh, red graph. If you look at the blue graph, you can see that area under the curve there where there's a significant more proportion of people getting in that 10, 20, and even 30%, even 40% weight loss categories are showing up now. And so again, this is the value to the patient of adding anti-obesity pharmacotherapy. We need to treat obesity as a chronic disease, much like we might do with hypertension. Here you can see in this study that showed that when patients use anti-obesity pharmacotherapy and achieve weight loss, if that medication is stopped at that dashed line, a significant proportion of patients regain that weight. So that weight comes back. This would be very similar that if we stopped their antihypertensive medicine at that dashed line as well, their blood pressure would go back up. This is only normal that the disease process comes back when you stop treating it. So it's very important to treat it chronically. So what are our key takeaways here? Obesity is a chronic disease. It's complex, it's multifactorial, and it warrants long-term chronic disease management. It's not something that people control just by their own volition. There are lots of different differences in body image perceptions as well of patients. So we have to come to this table with our patients, come to this shared decision-making, you know, in a manner that is both respectful to what they are struggling with and what we want to accomplish in terms of helping them get to better health. Assessing their readiness to change and where they can go from, from there and getting rid of some of these myths about the safety of anti-obesity pharmacotherapy and why they're likely to achieve their goal sometimes even twice or three or four times as likely to achieve that goal with using medication is key. And we have to recognize we ha this is a long game and not a short game. All right, so I'm gonna take it over from here for a little while. Uh, we're gonna transition to a new patient. So now we're gonna watch an introduction for Miss Alicia Torres. Hi, um, I'm Alicia, I'm 27 years old and I am here to meet with Dr. West for a second opinion. Um, I was diagnosed with PCOS when I was really young and I've been struggling with getting pregnant. Um, my OBGYN basically told me that I just need to lose a lot of weight before I can get pregnant and um, I'm really struggling with finding ways to do so, so I'm here for extra help. So Alicia is a 27 year old lady uh, who has a BMI of 38. She's relatively recently married, and she works as a bank associate and wants to start a family. She's here to work on health to optimize her fertility. We can see from her labs that she has an A1C of 5.6, suggesting insulin resistance with a HOMA IR of 4.2. Uh, she's got a nice blood pressure, and she has some lipids uh, that suggest uh, insulin resistance with an HDL of 38, 
triglycerides of 160, and a mild elevation in ALT suggestive of fatty liver. Her medical history is significant for uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, uh, and she reports being overweight since childhood. Her current medications include a multivitamin with iron uh, that's over the counter. So Dr. Fitch, at what stage would you consider Alicia to be uh, from a behavioral change perspective? Well, I definitely would say, you know, she's in this sort of, um, you know, preparation or even action stage because she's really, you know, coming wanting to have a second opinion and wanting someone to really, you know, help her with these pro this problem that she has. So I think she's in the right place, you know, trying to come, you know, to get help. Absolutely. And to what extent do you think that race or ethnicity influences someone's perception of their body weight? I think it's very important, right? Because when you, um, you know, live in, in and amongst your environment, right, with your people, so to speak, you know, with the, the people around you that you're seeing every day, you know, as those people have a different uh, body weight also, right, because a lot of times we're around people of the same race and ethnicity. And if, again, if, as that weight goes up, it sort of normalizes it a little bit. And so you might think, well, maybe I don't have a problem because everybody sort of has that same issue. The other thing is there's, there's a lot of um, racial and ethnic, uh, you know, for some groups, it was good to be heavier, right? In other words, it protected you or you were um, seen as being healthier when you had more weight. So again, it's very much a, we very much have to talk to patients about how they feel about that within the context of their cultural and environmental, um, you know, well-being. Absolutely. I think that's such an important point of the context of someone's lived experience. And so there are huge disparities with regards to the prevalence of obesity amongst different race ethnicity groups throughout the United States. We can see here in the bottom right that American Indian or Alaska Native are the, appear to be the most severely impacted by obesity, followed by non-Hispanic Blacks, Hispanics. Um, and it's so important for us to look at, well, what does this mean for someone when they're looking around and their family members or their peers may also be living with a similar level of obesity? And you're then telling them, hey, you're not healthy. I think it, it's important to frame things in the right kind of context and talk about health and not just about BMI and height to weight ratio to make sure that things are meaningful and important for people. We touched a little bit about kind of norms and ideals, but that also plays into the concept of body satisfaction and BMI. I'm, I'm going to kind of talk through this figure. It's a little bit complicated on the left-hand side of the slide, where what we're looking at in the dotted line are people who are reporting low satisfaction with their body image. And what we can see is that those who are at the higher end of the BMI spectrum on the x-axis report higher levels of dissatisfaction, if we will, with their body uh, image. And if we look at the um, solid line, these are people reporting kind of high levels of satisfaction with their bodies. And um, that we can see that that kind of peaks towards the lower end of the BMI spectrum, somewhere around kind of 19 to 24. And so what this shows is that, you know, higher body mass was, is negatively related to body image satisfaction for both sexes, for men and women here in this study. Black men and women reported more positive body image than white men and women. Hispanic and Asian men had similarly positive body image. And I think it's also important to note that there are differences in body image satisfaction, also noted by sexual orientation. So it's important to look at the context uh, of someone with regards to body image satisfaction, not just what is normal, but what, are you, what, are you, uh, what do you consider to be healthy and to be pleasing to you as an individual within the context of both your gender, sexual orientation, and other important socioecological factors that determine that. So to kind of shift back a little bit to Alicia, how significant do you think PCOS is as a barrier to weight loss for people? I do think it's, I think it's very significant. We know that while not everyone with PCOS has weight issues, uh, most people do, right? And this uh, insulin resistance syndrome associated with PCOS does make it harder for people to accomplish their goals because of that metabolic issue, not just sort of, um, you know, genetic and other factors, but they have that add-on metabolic issue they're trying to break through. 
Absolutely. As an endocrinologist practicing obesity medicine, it's a, it's a huge issue and it comes up in the office pretty much every day because PCOS affects, you know, somewhere between 5 to almost 20 percent of women and it causes a lot of potentially negative cardiometabolic effects. In, hyperinsulinemia is present or insulin resistance is present in three quarters or more of women with PCOS and while obesity is prevalent um, for people with PCOS, in some studies, they appear to lose just as much weight as women without PCOS. So is it, there's that contradiction in the literature. Of, is this a barrier for your weight loss? Well, yes, but also no. And I think that creates a further level of confusion for people living with PCOS as to what's going on with my body and how do I get control both of my reproductive health but also my cardiometabolic health too. I think the challenge is that women with PCOS then face additional issues once they overcome their fertility barriers or burdens that they will gain more weight in pregnancy on average compared to others. And I think there are some kind of disputes about, well, who's responsible for treating PCOS as well? You know, when we look, there can be the reproductive effects that maybe their OBGYN might be focused on in terms of, what, you know, what's going on, why are they having anovulatory cycles, skipping periods, having menstrual regularities, challenges with hirsutism or maybe acne. But I think kind of trying to find a happy medium of is this something that a primary care provider should be treating and assessing versus an OBGYN. I think this is really where us obesity specialists can kind of fill a void and provide evidence-based care and compassionate care for people who are wanting to feel better and to have uh, much better health both from a cardiometabolic and reproductive perspective because it's important. This can get people d down. There are psychological effects of this. There's a correlation with depression, anxiety, poor, poor uh, uh, self-esteem and lower body image, and the potential for disordered eating as well. The challenge is there aren't great evidence-based guidelines for how to approach this and treat this. If we look at the 2018 uh, treatment guidelines for, for PCOS, which was, you know, from an anti-obesity medication perspective, almost performed a different generation ago, there's heavy emphasis on the use of metformin um, for treatment, but not so much on the use of newer uh, more advanced anti-obesity medications or even bariatric metabolic surgery to help people. So it's important for us to look at the treatment of PCOS in the context of newer therapies that we have available. What we do know is that GLP-1 receptor agonists do help to reduce insulin resistance uh, and body weight in women with PCOS who also are living with overweight and obesity, and that's important. There have been numerous trials, most of them quite small and not necessarily very long in duration, evaluating medications that are also used for type 2 diabetes that include GLP-1 receptor agonists, SGLT2 inhibitors, and DPP-4s. Metformin is almost the house wine for PCOS with regards to trying to address some of the um, cardiometabolic or insulin resistance risks. Studies suggest that the combination of GLP-1 and metformin can be an optimal treatment regimen, but also the question of whether we can replace metformin with GLP-1 remains to be seen given the potential for these women getting pregnant and then also safety of that too. So I think it's important for us to, to acknowledge that, to know that there are medications that can help people perhaps lose greater body weight than with GLP-1 ones or at least the older GLP ones such as liraglutide. However, we're not just looking at reduction in body weight, we're also looking at reductions in cardiometabolic risk and insulin resistance and other factors that newer medications such as incretin-based therapies may be superior for doing. When we look at kind of how to approach this and discussing healthy weight loss for healthy pregnancies and healthy babies, sometimes these are competing interests. It's often that we have patients come into the office who want to lose weight for fertility but want to get pregnant at the same time, lose 60 pounds, and grow a healthy baby. And sometimes these are competing interests that just aren't possible. And having that meaningful discussion, connecting with your patient on what is your goal ultimately? How can we break this down into things that are going to be not just both achievable but also effective and to help you with the best possible, for example, pregnancy outcome? So, for example, the challenge with women trying to lose weight in pregnancy, and there are conflicting data about this, is that it, it can result in small for gestational uh, age infant in about 50% of the time. So we don't want people restricting calories. You need to grow a healthy baby. The challenge with pregnancy goals is often many women who are living with obesity may exceed the Institute of Medicine recommendations for gaining uh, 11 to 20 pounds during pregnancy. In fact, even people without a history of obesity may have challenges staying within those guides. And it's something that we hear about you know, pretty frequently in the office with regards to kind of the stepping up with sequential pregnancies of weight gain for women. 
The challenge for treating obesity in someone who wants to become pregnant is that these anti-obesity medications we currently have, as great as they are, they're all contraindicated with respect to pregnancy. And so these aren't something that we should continue or promote for people who are actively trying to get pregnant or who may be pregnant for sure. So our key takeaways for this section is that we need to work on how to counsel patients about lifestyle, behavioral, genetic, environmental, and obesogenic medications or psychological factors that may be contributing to weight gain. What this really says is obesity is a chronic and complex disease, and we need to acknowledge all the factors that are feeding into it so that we can address the person and not the number on the scale. We need to set realistic goals and assess patient acceptance for and commitment to managing a treatment plan for their obesity. We need to look at obesity management strategies that are recommended within current guidelines and include the use of anti-obesity medications where appropriate. We need to be aware that issues that might affect uh, weight management, pregnancy, and PCOS, because this is a, a population of people for whom there are a lot of moving parts, and we want to make sure that ultimately we are doing no harm and helping our patients to achieve their health goals, and all the while working to educate patients about the health benefits of weight loss or even having a healthier body weight because even small amounts can mitigate obesity-related complications and help people to get to their weight and health goals. In this next section, we're going to meet a new patient, Ms. Nora McElhenney. My husband has really been nagging me to see you ever since we found out that my weight precludes me from having knee surgery. Oh my God, I'm just like, I just feel like I'm destined to be fat, you know? And I don't have any reason to believe that anything else is going to work. So Ms. McElhenney is a 64-year-old lady who has a BMI of 50. So she's got class 3 or severe obesity. Um, her husband helped to set up the telehealth visit, and she's feeling discouraged because she wants to have a knee replacement but is unable to do so because of her current body weight. She has a history of bariatric surgery and has experienced significant weight recurrence uh, since undergoing sleeve gastrectomy several years ago. She has a history of anti-obesity medication uses with some kind of variable side effects and also variable effectiveness of what she experienced. Since uh, having the weight loss surgery, she's had recurrence in body weight, but also recurrence in type 2 diabetes with a hemoglobin A1C close to 9%. Her labs uh, are suggestive um, of kind of cardiovascular risk, kind of with um, a treated hyperlipidemia picture and a slightly low HDL uh, for a woman. Her medical history is significant for depression, uh, anxiety, fatty liver, hyperlipidemia, hypertension. And a lot of the medications she's taking really promote weight gain, too. She's taking glomeparide uh, for her diabetes, which we know can help to promote uh, weight gain or excess body weight. She's also taking uh, medications for her mental health, her depression and anxiety, which can promote weight gain, too, primarily mirtazapine. And so I think it's important to look at a patient's medication list because things can almost snowball over time. Many patients will end up on gabapentin, as she has for knee pain, and may be on escalating doses all of the time. And when you ask them, you know, hey, how has this helped your knee pain? They're like, well, you know what? It really hasn't. And so if something's really not adding benefit, maybe they shouldn't be taking it because it may be having an unwanted impact on their body weight too. So evaluating a patient's medication chart, making sure that they're not on anything which is taking them away from their weight goal, but also making sure they're not on anything harmful. And as an obesity medicine uh, specialist, seeing someone uh, who has a history of bariatric surgery taking ibuprofen 800 milligrams twice a day gives me a little bit of reflux too. So I think it's important for us to make sure that we're not letting our patients do things that are harmful for their health. Right. And I think, too, you know, the other thing is that it's very challenging sometimes. I mean, she really feels like she, you know, she has this knee pain. She needs the knee surgery. And how am I going to get there? Right. Because I already had this this surgery and I've already sort of let myself down, which is creating this vicious cycle of depression as well. And then and then also, you know, more overeating because of it. Absolutely. And I think we can get into so many challenges when we have kind of these cycles of things with overlays. And so, you know, with all that being said, what, change, what stage of change do you think Nora currently is at? You know, that's kind of a hard one for me. I'm not the best, you know, motivational interviewer on the planet, but I'm going to take a stab at it. I mean, I think she's definitely in, you know, in a little bit of an action phase. You know, she here, she's here. She wants help. I mean, she's, she's coming in, you know, she recognizes and then I'd also say she's, she's sort of relapsed, right? She was probably 
like, you know, at this stage of change and then, you know, with her surgery and everything that she did. And then she's now kind of had this relapse, which is really sort of affecting her, right, in terms of her mental health and her well-being. And, and yes, her husband, you know, encouraged her, but at least during the, you know, the interaction with her, you know, she was at least um, sort of willing to, to get treatment and to get help. Absolutely. I think you're being too incredibly modest with regards to your motivational interviewing skills. I think you have a level of mastery many of us aspire to. And, and I totally agree that she is kind of vacillating between this kind of action and relapse phases where she is, is presenting for an appointment that her husband kind of arranged for her to talk somewhat openly about what her challenges are, but acknowledging that she has been successful with weight loss in the past, but is currently experiencing recurrence. And I think it's it's easy to see how we can get caught up in the frustration of seeing recurrence in body weight when we've been to so many lengths uh, to treat it before. And I think so much of that, you know, can inform then kind of biases amongst healthcare professionals and how the challenges that creates for people who are coming to seek evidence-based treatments. I, I tell our trainees all the time, we need to check our biases at the door and presumptive medicine is not a specialty. What we need to do is to take an appropriate contextual history for the patient and find out what their lived experience is. And I think many people and healthcare providers who have not experienced obesity for themselves will not truly understand the challenges that people living in a larger body will face in terms of discrimination and health challenges or even day-to-day -day movement that may be problematic. And I think it's challenging when people are then using those biases to say that people with obesity don't need medicines and definitely don't need surgery. What they need to do is focus in on lifestyle modification. And even though something hasn't worked for them before, they just need to try harder. I don't think that's either effective or compassionate medicine. And I think what we need to do is also make sure, especially as subspecialists, that you know, be aware of the social stigma that's associated with obesity and the challenge it presents for many patients to seek care for obesity, especially such as Nora when they've experienced weight recurrence and they're coming back again for another treatment when they feel that they have failed. And I think that's, that's not fair. I think, you know, treatments fail, not, not humans. And I think, you know, nearly, <laughs> nearly all of us can say that, you know, we need to look at the socioeconomic challenges that are presented in terms of when people are living with severe obesity and how that impacts both their health and their ability to, have, to um, provide for themselves, their families, and to fulfill what they may see as their role within society or within their social units. Um, it's important to note that many PCPs or primary care providers exhibit biases that interfere with or perhaps even interfere with offering evidence-based therapies to people with obesity. I, I think often providers may lack a, a knowledge that there are safe and effective and durable impacts of obesity treatments such as anti-obesity medications or surgery for people with obesity. Um, there may be kind of the bias that people with obesity have done this to themselves and patients with obesity, people with obesity will internalize that in a way that stops them from accessing health care. And I think that leads to a belief that, you know, what we're doing is just, look, what's the use? This is kind of what, what's meant to be, and that's not true. And that's challenging because people with obesity then delay or avoid care or end up kind of switching health care providers multiple times, which is almost kind of leading to both a delay in care and repeated trauma with stigmatizing experiences over and over again. And so I think it's important that we acknowledge these challenges and move forward so that people with obesity don't have repeated trauma when they come to see us for help. It's important to acknowledge as well that there is this kind of um, bi-directional relationship between obesity and depression or mental health um, issues, uh, which can be from a variety of factors, including you know, underlying genetics, microbiome, chronic stress, genetics, uh, early life or adverse um, childhood experiences. And I think you know, for patients such as Nora, who kind of hints towards early um, adverse childhood experiences, it's important to screen our patients who may be kind of giving us a little bit of a signal that there's something going on in the background to screen for kind of a history of either act or ongoing or history of things like abuse, uh, abandonment, neglect, or other challenges within the home, including substance use and misuse either by themselves uh, or by loved ones, which may be contributing to the stress, depression, low mood, and just more barriers to them looking after themselves in a way that is meaningful and helpful for them. And with that, you know, 
can anti-obesity medications be used to treat people with obesity? I think you know ma many times providers say, well, I I'm not going to focus on the obesity because the patient needs to focus on their mental health, and until they get their stuff together, we won't we won't help them with their weight. But that's not entirely true. I think there's so many thing ways in which there's this bi-directional relationship, especially amongst women, that there can be an improvement in mental health stresses and burdens with improvements in body weight as it informs their quality of life and relationship with themselves and others. And I think it's important to acknowledge that we don't have to lay a foundation of fixing mental health before we work on obesity because aside from the obesity impacting their mental health, it's also, for many people, a time bomb from a cardiometabolic and other risk perspective. And I think many of our patients will acknowledge that treating their obesity will help their mental health um, pretty significantly. You know, in a 52-week observational study of liraglutide, phantomintopyramide, naltrexin, bupropion, uh, and other components in people with obesity and psychiatric illness or mental health challenges, um, found no deterioration in mental health uh, for any treatment, perhaps maybe a little bit with topiramate. I think it's important to note that these treatments are safe, but it's important to screen for um, mental health challenges to just make sure we're not going to exacerbate them by treatment. And if we have concerns, collaborating with our friends in psychiatry to make sure that the patient is being looked after in the best, most evidence-based way, or if the patient has an existing psychiatrist to communicate with them what your intentions and plans are so that they're on board so we can look after the patient as a team. And I think it's also important, given that many medications that are used for treating obesity can also impact mental health and mood, to make sure that we screen for those in a kind of a sequential way uh, within office visits, which is something that we do in our program. So what I want to ask you next is, well, Nora has a history of bariatric surgery and has had weight recurrence. Can we use anti-obesity medications in patients after bariatric surgery? Most certainly, yes. Um, in fact, we see in some studies that patients respond even better, you know, after surgery to some of our medications. So I think it's very important, you know, to not limit it to people that have not had, you know, that are surgical naive, right? I mean, these are just good medications for everybody to be more successful with their weight management. Absolutely. And I think it's so important to note that, you know, the, the weight loss that's experienced after bariatric surgery or anti-obesity medications or even lifestyle is highly variable and tends to follow this kind of normal distribution. When we look at the study here, what they show is kind of the variability both in terms of nadir weight or the amount of weight that's lost with bariatric surgery, in this case, Roux-Noir gastric bypass, but then also the variability in terms of weight recurrence after the surgery as well. And I think you said it really nicely that, you know, anti-obesity medications are not just for people who are kind of, who have not had bariatric surgery. And we've done some work here at our institution showing the benefits of anti-obesity medications and the suggestions that regimens that contain incretin-based therapies or GLP-1 are more uh, helpful for weight loss versus those that don't. And recent papers showing that semaglutide may be more effective than liraglutide for treating weight recurrence after bariatric surgery too. And I think there are several strategies that we can look at as we try to approach treating bariatric or post-bariatric weight recurrence, which can be challenging. The top part of this um, image suggests kind of surgical interventions uh, for surgery, and there can be either conversions to different types of surgeries, um, such as converting a lap band uh, or adjustable gastric band to sleeve uh, gastrectomy or renal gastric bypass or the pancreatic diversion. Uh, but also there are endoscopic or endobariatric interventions that can also be done if a patient is feeling a little bit apprehensive about, as they would say, going under the knife again in a traditional sense of an OR and general anesthesia, where they may feel more comfortable having an endobariatric revision to decrease their gastrojejunal anastomosis or to do an endoscopic resleeve. There's also important to focus in on the lifestyle management as a foundation, behavioral components, making sure that their mental health uh, is as well managed as possible and that we're putting together appropriate goal setting and sustainable, beha sustainable behaviors, focusing in on the dietary components of post-bariatric management, making sure that we're not uh, creating or propagating any nutritional deficiencies or taking their vitamins and also meeting their protein intake and other goals, and considering pharmacologic agents where helpful. You know, we touched on that a little bit earlier, but these medications are also helpful for people after bariatric surgery to not just achieve a healthier weight, but to maintain it long term too. How significant do you think other factors such as menopause are as barriers for weight loss in somebody like Nora? I think they're quite significant. I think that, um, you know, we, uh, 
expect that in menopause there will be weight gain. I mean, that's what the data shows us, even just sort of menopause in its, in its nature of itself. Um, and then there are a lot of complicating factors of it, you know, in terms of how symptomatic you are and whether those symptoms are being treated in the long run. And so here we see um, some, of these, some of those biological changes I mentioned with menopause and obesity. In early menopause, we have some early changes, uh, you know, in, as an increase in our FSH and our estrogen remains relatively the same. But we can see even some increased cardiovascular risk factors even in early perimenopause. And then as we get into late perimenopause and postmenopause, you know, we really see, again, more of these body composition changes with an increase in fat mass and a decrease in lean mass, which together, again, promotes more fat storage over time. And also significant effects on people's sleep. You know, as you have an effect on your sleep, you're going to have an increased cardiovascular risk in and, of, in and of itself. That's been shown. But also an increased tendency towards increasing appetite as well as increasing fat storage with a decrease in sleep. So that's a big factor there as well. Also, when we look at some of the older classes of glucose lowering medications, you know, they also tended to promote more weight gain, right? And in this case, Nora is on a sulfonylurea, as you mentioned earlier. And you can see here that some of these older medications had significantly associated weight gain, you know, versus some of our newer medications, which actually help to promote weight loss. So again, identifying those in patients can be key. Setting realistic expectations for people with obesity and diabetes is also important, right? So again, when, we, when we've noticed our studies, what one thing has been shown is that people with diabetes tend to lose a little less weight than people without diabetes if you just have obesity in and of itself. So here you can see the mean placebo subtracted weight loss of our different agents as it relates to those patients with diabetes. And so again, if we look at some of our newer medications that are coming on the market, you know, we're very excited about terzepatide as a potential for an obesity agent because we do have data from the Surmount trial, which was done and shown here on the right-hand side, which was looked at weight loss with terzepatide in patients without diabetes. On the left-hand side is the Surpass data, which is the data used to get terzepatide approved for patients with diabetes, which did show significant weight loss, but you can set, show even more weight loss, as you see here, in those patients without diabetes who are taking it for obesity. So we're looking forward to this being another agent in our toolbox uh, coming hopefully soon uh, to be able to help patients achieve even more weight loss, getting up into this 20% on average uh, weight loss uh, for people with obesity. And so our key takeaways here are that we're really gonna counsel patients about the rationale for long-term obesity management as a chronic disease. Just like Nora had, you know, her disease process is gonna come back, just like all diseases do. We don't uh, cure a lot of these chronic diseases. We manage them in the long run. We're gonna really help to set realistic goals and expectations when initiating AOMs so that people can know what to expect and address any of these barriers that people might have, you know, such as uh, menopause, depression, as was noted here, and really optimize those two things together, as you mentioned, and not, not sort of wait for one to get better and the other, et cetera. And then educate about patients about the health benefits of weight loss, even modest amounts of weight, and really you know, sort of keep them going in this motivational interviewing fashion because we know chronic diseases are hard to treat in the long run, and we really have to be there as that coach or cheerleader you know, to really help them you know, stay focused on the end goal, which is to improve their health. That ends our discussion for today. I hope you found the activity informative and useful to your practice and encourage you to download the resources and slides from the menu on the left side of the screen. Thank you, Dr. Armandos, for spending time with me today talking about this important topic. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash QFA 860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Lilly.